Good afternoon. I'm Daniel Beaker. I'm a technical director at NXP Semiconductor and just recently celebrated my 42nd year in August working for the Motorola Freescale NXP uh, Evolution and uh, became a signal integrity focus engineer about 15 years ago and uh, my first PCD West was 2004 and that started my journey. The most recent things that I'm experiencing in EMC is really not so much a, a positive but a, uh, a failing that I've been seeing more and more. The uh, power supply simulation tools will provide you with uh, a result that says that you've done a, pos a good design but then the results are that the system fails and an inspection of the printed circuit board shows that there is a someplace in the power supply a major discontinuity in the flow of the energy and that was missed by the simulation tool and people count very heavily on being able to use the results of these very expensive tools and I think that's something the industry needs to take a closer look at. The idea that a switch connects a conductor and starts the current flowing in a loop is one of the mistakes that we have in our, our understanding industry-wide. What happens is, is you have energy stored in the space behind the switch, um, the, the signal trace, the ground, and in that dielectric there's electromagnetic field. And when the switch closes, what happens is now it connects a space on the other side of the switch that the energy will want to move into. There's a lower voltage in that area and there's been no uh, displacement of, of some of the electrons, which is what people think is the main energy source, but the field is what carries the energy. So the field will then start moving sequentially into the new space that's connected. Just like if you turn on a faucet of a water hose, the water would move starting at the beginning of the hose and eventually make its way to the other end. So there's no idea in the mind of the field of what's at the other end. And basically, the highest amount of energy that can flow through the space will then start moving from the new connected pole in the, in the dielectric and follow that into the very end. But So for the, the beginning of the movement of the energy, it looks like a short circuit. But there's nothing happening at the, at the end of the transmission line until the waves actually get there, moving at the speed of light, which in PC board materials typically around six inches in a nanosecond. The trace spacing in, in the layout is extremely important, um, first from a, from a radiator emissions and robustness for susceptibility problem, because you need to make sure that you've routed good transmission lines that are the trace is one dielectric away from the ground plane. And the, uh, the distance between the traces becomes important depending on the, the um, strength of the signal, or the, the switching speed of the, of the wavefront and it, as it moves into the space. And what happens is as you have a changing electric field at the wave front of the signal moving through the, board, through the transmission line, this creates a, a changing magnetic field that then is going to cause a change in electric field in the surrounding dielectrics. And if there's a trace that's too close and can be affected by this aggressor trace, then this changing voltage in the space between two traces will now cause a changing magnetic field in the, the second trace, which will now create a changing electric field in the trace underneath. So the energy will leapfrog from one signal to the next, and the amount of aggression that a signal can provide determines how much energy and how much interference it has with the second trace. So typically you want to make sure you understand the nature of these signals and you will then be able to determine how far apart they need to be in order to keep them safe. The other thing you want to do is make sure that on the outer surfaces of your circuit board that you want to keep maximum ground flood there to help reduce the uh, impact of ESD impulses on it so you can be compliant both in 
the functionality, but also be able to survive in the environment that your product's going to be used in. So these are really important when you change dielectric layers. You have a signal on the outer layer, and you need to move it down in the board stack, and if it's not on layer three, with two being ground, then the signal via has to have as close as you are allowed to by manufacturing a ground transition via that connects the dielectrics and the z-axis. And the technique that my team uses is we will place them so that the keep-out rings on each of the vias overlap so that then you can't route anything between those two vias because that would be violating that space. And by making sure that all your signals are well-defined in all three dimensions helps reduce the susceptibility and reduce the radiated emissions, making the whole design more robust. I, I'm a proponent of maximum ground. I want to leave all the copper on the board that I paid for, so I do a minimum match approach and, leave, and make all of these extra shapes connected to ground. Uh, I use a minimum of two vias, or I move things around in order to make that happen, and then I will actually delete some of the islands if they, I can't get two ground vias into them. And then the other thing we try to do is, wherever these shapes overlap in the board stack, is to try a, drop a via through there, tying all of them together. And this use of uh, ground copper helps to build a pseudo-Faraday cage out of the circuit board, and the increased surface area on the outer parts of the board, the top and the bottom, provide a much larger surface for, again, ESD impulses to be distributed across that, so it reduces the voltage applied to each square centimeter of the board surface, and again, that's a way of reducing EMC and improving the, the behavior of the overall circuit board. I've used them in the past. Some of the times we use ground and grids is where you have a large a board with a lot of layers and there's a large thermal mass that might interfere with some of the reflow. I don't know that there's any advantage on the outer layers to use a grid. It's taking more copper off which costs more money and increases the uh, waste products created during the fabrication. And I think that in our day and age we want to want to reduce the amount of waste we, we create and by Keeping the acid cleaner, it improves the quality of the etch that you do want and can help you increase your board yield in fabrication as well. Shielding is, is basically making sure that the signals have their own discrete space to be in. And you want to follow the one dielectric rule. The signal needs to be one space, one ground one layer away from ground. And that provides a low impedance transmission line which helps to shield the, the signal from other, other incursions of other energies that are present in the in environment. Now, if it's a very sensitive signal, then you would increase the shielding for that by routing it on inner layers and also by keeping a lot of ground floor next to each side of this so that the signal is, is basically isolated from anything else that would be affected. It will help because it, it makes it easier to keep the aggressor signals away from those components and the, the signals routing into them. So, for example, an A to D input that needs to have very accurate information presented. So you want to have very little changes in that input voltage that are not directly associated with the sensor that you're trying to read. Uh, oscillator circuits are another very sensitive circuit in the system, and you want to protect oscillators from being impacted by ESD or any other sig signals that are around it. And uh, those are often seem to be the the problem, but an oscillator is a low voltage and low amplitude signal that is more easy to disturb than it causes any havoc. And typically the input is a Schmidt trigger, and it doesn't take very much noise on that input bin to cause extra counts in the PLL, and if there are too many of those events, then you will end up losing lock on your 
to crystal, and the system will typically reset. Those are two important things to protect. Most radio emissions is caused by depletion waves, which are either the, the transmission line for power delivery is broken, meaning it's not kept one dielectric away from ground, or that the first order capacitor isn't placed close enough. So the rules for placing caps are pretty simple. We use a 20th wavelength of the switching speed of the uh, transistors that are being fed from that power supply. And as long as you can place a capacitor in that proximity, then you're going to have good performance because there's going to be enough time to supply energy from a closely placed capacitor. For, for example, a, a one nanosecond switching event, as long as you have the capacitor within about a half an inch routed as a good transmission line, you're within that 20th wavelength and you can do good power supply designs for that. For more, in more speedy switching events like supporting the cores, you want to place those as close as you can to the IC. Now, typically that would be placed between the, the pins on the bottom of the board if it's a BGA. Uh, if it's a QFP or some other similar package, then you can place the capacitor right across a pair of the leads on the surface of the board. But the idea is to make sure the connection is a good low impedance transmission line and the travel time from the, the IC pins to the capacitor are as short as you can make it. A round trip of a sixteenth of an inch is basically 20 picoseconds. So those are the kind of things you want to think about. Always place the capacitor as close as there is room, but the hierarchy is based on the switching speed of the transistors that you're trying to support. Core being the first order. For termination, that's where you again need to know the switching speed of the driver. And if the distance between the driver and the receiver are more than a quarter wavelength, then you will start to have ringing, which is both an EMC problem as well as a signal integrity problem. So what you would do then is to, within the, what's called the lump distance, the quarter wavelength, or I use a six wavelength because I'm pretty conservative, you place a series resistor in, within the lump distance and then you route a control impedance, typically 50 ohm transmission line, and that will improve signal integrity and reduce EMC issues.